You have questions coming in, FYI. Oh, you want to pull those up? It's just Kenny's the only question. Kenny! <laughs> uh, love Kenny. Hey, hey, love me some Kenny. Uh, sorry if the webinar is a little bit uh, smaller than normal today. We had some communication hiccups, but um, we'll be able to send this post hoc to the whole list. But for everybody joining us, welcome. We are happy to host you on this wonderful hump day. As always, I'm joined with my partners in crime, the wonderful South Carolinian, uh, Logan, the whale wangler Brown, the pickleball aficionado. I mean, the, the fish fanatic, the, the superlatives can go on and on. Uh, welcome, Logan. The, dead, the deadhead traveler. The I have a lot of head. interest, guys. Okay, I'm in F1 and pickleball and deadhead did, stuff. Did man. you fancy up your... Is that lightning? That's fancy. Or do you like this? They, I can change this, the color. I don't know if I like blue. It's a little weird. Oh, look at this. Oh, wow. Gray. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh. a, like a sunset gradient. And just but I really need like some better background. Like, a new competitor know. has entered the space. He has. You, you do need a little <laughs> bit of... Uh, you got to pump up that vision board a little bit. But uh, I, I like... That's, my, I like that's my board of flair. You guys ever seen that movie? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have 20 pieces of flair so, on it yet. <laughs> well, do you want to do the minimum? Is that what <laughs> we want at Schlotzky's? Um, that was actually a uh, majority of it was filmed in Austin. So oh, cool. A little fun fact there, powerful office space. And then always the sexiest Utah on the planet, the smartest, most enlightened person on the planet, Sandra Schroeder. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, hey. Uh, making, making me blush. He's got the coolest good. background. I just can't get over all the cool artwork. His, 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 his sense of style is impeccable, exquisite, one might even say. Do you want to uh, hear, hear something funny that I do. just reminded me? So Logan and I have been debating on who has better barbecue, South Carolina Ooh. Oh my God. or Austin. Oh, my and God. I, that's not an argument. Right? That's, a pro, said, that's a profiling question. Come on. Good, There's this only one answer to that. Just wait. Just wait. So – I said Austin, and I said I would be able to tell in a blinded taste test what was Austin in South Carolina. And he's like, there's the spot here that's so good. And then he pulls it up, and it says, bring <laughs> Texas barbecue to South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. No, uh, it is really good, though. <laughs> no doubt. I mean, it's it, it's almost like pizza, right? Like, it's hard to, it's hard to miss on the pizza, and there's levels to it, but... Um, not only would I say we have the highest magnitude, but if you take like our top five, top seven barbecue joints, the the average score there would be top tier in the country. Uh, uh, what about like Kansas City? Do they do they are they up there? They're okay. So the challenge they're, is you they're get like for ends there. Yeah, that's kind of like Tennessee, like Memphis barbecue kind of stuff. It's it's not horrible, but uh, I don't know. I'm just very maybe a homer pick to be fair. But uh, La Barbecue, Valentino's, Lambert's. There's some. Franklin's obviously there's some some big hitters. Um, Terry okay, Black's for Lambert's. Terry Black's is not better than Lambert's, but Yo, so uh, much stop. you guys, you guys <laughs> are telling me. Go back to your LeBron. Oh, LeBron did pull it off though. To be fair, Curry, Curry is game one. Yeah, game one. Game one, just game one. Um, let's we've see. all seen this before. <laughs> yeah, we've all seen this before. Uh, as always, if you guys have any questions, just toss them in the uh, Q and A down there in the chat. Uh, what else we got? There was a cool little creative hack from Sarah Levenger from uh, the site called Talk Comment, and you could actually basically fake a comment on your TikTok, which is kind of really interesting, um, where you can use kind of frequently asked questions, and you see that. It's actually a really interesting strategy. There was a gal that was a musician, and her manager had commented pre, like this was pre-planned, but it seemed spontaneous, commented on the TikTok. And it blew up and it ended up getting her a record deal. She's a big streamer on uh, Spotify. So definitely a really oh. cool, cool way to uh, organically surface some, uh, some pushback to your brand. We had a bunch of earnings mm -hmm. come out. Facebook is absolutely zooming. Even after they took everybody's money, they are, uh, the stock is absolutely screaming. Oh, yeah. Have you heard any update on that? No. I, the last I've heard was that people are – people that were affected will be eligible for some form of compensation. But we actually w went into this on uh, one of the podcasts on ad spend about how it was a pretty big debacle. Uh, you know, I think there's, I don't remember if we talked about it last week or not, but the sense of uh, there's kind of a three phase 
PR crisis management playbook that's that's pretty tried and true where the first phase is obviously you you say hey we messed up Mitch, sorry you have a problem yeah exactly yeah you know the book here's the, here's the <laughs> we're sorry we did this take responsibility this was our fault and then the third thing is um, what we're going to do to fix it and when that happens and how are we going to future proof um, so I think Facebook really missed on all three. Again, there's probably a lot of legality stuff that if they do come out and say that maybe there's some semblance of admission of guilt that could then open them to some sort of legal stuff. But yep. the other thing we were kind of talking about was that this is kind of what you get when you have a monopoly. Like, what are you going to do? Not advertise on Facebook? No, exactly. you're, you're going to put as much money in as possible. And so that's the, the give and the take where it's still the best, biggest ad buy out there. So um, hopefully they'll have uh, something. And if you did get got, um, we will hopefully get you some money back. What else? Big, big pay or a big push on uh, snail mail. Uh, Post pilot has been popping its little head up. So if you guys haven't played around with any of the snail mail stuff, there's a really nice integration between post pilot and Clavio. Um, you can do that. What else? I got obviously chat GPT stuff. Oh, have you guys played around with, or, Oh, we got a question coming in too. Have you guys messed around with or played with the uh, Shopify Collective? Shopify Collective, no. Oh, oh what is that? Here. So this is, it's really cool. I'm really bullish on it. So there's not only Shopify Collective, there's also Collabs. So Collabs is their, uh, like UGC play, almost like a marketplace where I can go find people. Um, it's it's like pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They've really hammered a lot of the big pain points of finding creators, paying creators, compensating creators, doing everything all within the Shopify ecosystem. So I really like that. Um, so if you haven't played around with that, that's Shopify Collabs. Go check it out. Give us your feedback there. If anybody's uh, used it, pop it in the chat. Let us know what you guys think about it. Um, then there's also Shopify Collective. So this is different. So what Shopify Collective is... It, for lack of a better explanation, it's almost like drop shipping from other stores. And so, uh, for for example, if Sonder had uh, a sneaker store and he was selling sneakers, he could throw on like look see designs, like my my big favorites that make these beautiful displays in the post purchase or um, Red Moose. Shout out Morty in the uh, a sneaker cleaning kit or whatever. And so, it's essentially you can start to place uh, other Shopify stores products on your post purchase page after people check out too. And you get obviously oh, a little bit of a cut. You get a little bit of sauce. Um, but is this gonna totally undercut what's their faces? Uh, who are the guys that were doing this? Group shop was doing something peripherally related. Um, no, Disco else? Network. Disco. Disco was also doing something uh, in this. Yeah, uh, I think, I think it, it is doing something in this. I think it's like their main thing, isn't it's, it? Pr I'm pretty sure, yes. So this is huh. definitely going to uh, – there's the the Apple Sherlock kind of thing. They're getting Sherlocked where it's – it's uh, yeah, Disco. Yeah, Bobby's Bobby's hip. Um, yeah, so anyways. That's, it, that's crazy. It's cool, right? I think that could be really interesting. I've been really, um, really interested in figuring out – I think there's going to be a really big resurgence. And you, and you kind of talked about this as well, Sandra, of the uh, – community commerce, I think there's going to be a really big play here, especially being able like, I would, I would absolutely, I'm already hot and bothered. It's already on shop <laughs> network, so I can easily pay for something. And if it's like something ancillary, like related, I would, again, think of like, if you bought a super fancy espresso maker, like maybe you're going to need espresso cups, maybe you need a tamper. There's all these little cool things that um, start to build around it. So I, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on Shopify Collective. They've been doing uh, some really cool stuff there. Oh, the other thing they just launched, which is coming soon. Coming back, I promise. Logan has been smacking the data team with a whip, as I have I. But um, they released their version one of uh, Merchant Bookmarks, um, which was quasi-interesting. Uh, pretty cool, but not as robust as our benchmarks once we get them back uh, because they don't have any ad data. But I thought that was kind of interesting. A little... Uh, Little Shopify benchmarks there. Uh, what else do I got? Hey, while we're talking later, drop the uh, link for Shopify Collective in the chat because I even a quick Google search didn't get me there. I know that's what I was looking at too. Collective or collab? 
collective. The collective thing. I think that sounds neat. The collective thing is the, uh, uh, where is it? Exchange collective dropship app. That? Collect. It can't be it. No. no. It's, let me show you. Let's see if somebody beats us. Like it's, I'm really, I guess, uh, bringing it while you're looking, bringing this back yep. together for people, for the viewers, why they care. Yes. I'm really curious, like things like Disco, Shopify Collective, and even if, like Rob was saying with direct mail, um, when I was using direct mail, it was mainly around um, remarketing to past customers that had kind of yep. fallen off the wagon. But I wonder if these channels will become viable growth opportunities for new customer acquisition. I just, I know the direct mail was a little expensive on oh, the cap. I found it cheap. I mean, it's cheap per mailer, but like the conversion rate, I didn't find that enticing. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's changed, but yeah, new customer acquisition would be interesting. And then, uh, like on, on the Shopify collective, like, can you, will other stores be willing to put your brand out there and can that really help with firing up your acquisition? Yeah, no, totally tracking there. I think there is a certain, a certain aspect of, obviously you're going to be able to ch you know, um, choose who's on your site, et cetera, et cetera. Why can't I find this either? Am I making this, oh, I'm not making this up, right? Maybe they I, took it down. They got right? in trouble. Yeah. Maybe Shopify. it's with a K instead of a C. Shopify doesn't get it. Oh. <laughs> nice. It probably it. is. <laughs> Why is this? this yeah. Huh. That's well, crazy. Probably Anyways, we'll find we'll it later. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll post it out later. Uh, but it looks really amazing. Here we go. Maybe this is it. Hmm. Anyways, we are, what else we got? Uh, Kenny put a question in the chat. Oh, I may love me some Kenny B. Let's go, Kenny. Uh, for let's do this. When will TW have the cost for Clavian PostScript appear in the ads pixel dashboard? Um, I'll jump in here and then obviously we'll get the product guy Logan to put in here. Um, there's not so with with Clavio PostScript, that is not necessarily considered a quote unquote ad spend, that would be more OPEX. Um, or SGNA with marketing costs. So there's not a real good way to equate your Clavio cost or PostScript cost in, a, in an effective, meaningful way. Um, what I would do is just add those as custom expenses in your uh, expenses. And then from that, you can either use some net profit calculations or something of that nature. But I don't know what the value add would be in terms of the cost for something like Clavio or PostScript because it's not necessarily, or I think of it as a, a pretty uh, cut and dry kind of uh, op OPEX expense. But what's your well, take? Robert, to push back, would you, especially for SMS though, because it's, that's dynamic, it's a variable expense, meaning- I mean, Clavio spend... is, if you you can well, call it that too, right? That's why it gets into the. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. But it scales with you. Like if you have five hundred, five like fifty thousand subscribers, you can send as many emails as you want to them, right? You're paying no, you per seat. Pay per send. You, per you send. pay. You pay. You pay list size. It's like a million sends or whatever, right? But yeah. but like for SMS, isn't it like you literally pay five cents, three cents per send every time you hit send on SMS? Yeah. So you have. They're both variable costs, but in a in a non meaningful way. Where uh, again, they're they're usage based in that sense. So you could kind of quote unquote call them variable, but the challenge is it's not like super clean and cut because you don't have. So anyways, Dylan Denry, I absolutely understand where you're getting at, but for me, or put it this way, what would you derive from that? From seeing the cost data like th there's nothing that would make like you're not going to use clavio now you're not going to use that like th there's nothing so it, it's more for me are these things returning and then are your opex in line with your goals like it, it doesn't I, or anyways i'm not trying to shit on it i'm just trying to understand like what the actual takeaway i'm trying be. but you did <laughs> and the sleeping <laughs> I, I just don't understand what how would you use this data point to make your marketing better yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I think it's it's binary. Like, are you going like, I suppose maybe it could help you visualize if you're overspending on PostScript, 
right? Like maybe what does I'm, that mean though? Uh, like maybe you would tailor your your filter criteria to who you send to, to be more of like active engagers with the site or with your brand. And I don't know if you, I, unless you're looking at each campaign in PostScript on its own, maybe maybe Tripwell can just help you visualize the click-based attribution against certain segments that you've sent to, right? Yeah, with I'm with cost, you on that. But oh, and with so the cost associated, saying... like like you could have like an inactive, like not inactive, but like. 60 to 90 day um, purchasers that have not visited the site in 30 days and you spend $500 targeting them with an SMS campaign and PostScript may claim some, you know, attribution, but Triple Whale will tell you that like hardly any of them clicked. So should I have done that? Maybe but not. we can already see that in the pixel. Like nothing you just said there has any implications or me telling you how much that cost would not impact my strategy. Like I totally get what you're saying in terms of the unit economics. Like you should definitely understand your unit economics, right? Like if I send out X amount of SMSs, it's going to cost me around Y. So I need to get my return on investment. And that, that's why I'm not a big proponent of MMS because it does get into some, some decent numbers, especially if you're sending a tall, bigger list because you can get into like, you send a gift, you send some emojis, you start to get into, you know, three messages sent to one person on top of the MMS, et cetera, et cetera. But again, yeah. like that doesn't impact my strategy or tactics. That's something that I need to understand at the operational level where it's like, hey, PostScript is not generating the value we need it to generate. But that's not like a, that's not on the campaign level. This is just a, for me, an in, in operational expense. And then do we need SMS? Is there a cheaper version of SMS or is PostScript really the best because they're generating me all this money? So for me, it's not something that, I'm going to look at and say, oh, this PostScript campaign did well, but this one didn't. And then like, it, it's not a reflection necessarily of me of PostScript. It's, hey, do I have the money to have this tool to then capitalize on this tool? And then there's, you know, maybe a semblance of ROI. But for me at the campaign level, it doesn't really give me a ton of insight into how I would change my business. Um, but again, maybe that's just me. I don't know, Sandra, where, where do you land on this? Yeah, I need a I need an au contraire button over here, you know. Oh, look at this guy! It's two on one right now. Help me out, chat. Okay, so give me give me the skinny then. Where where how how would you integrate cost into making your marketing campaigns better? Like it doesn't make sense to me. It's like either here's the tool, here's what we're going to pay for it, here's what we can get out of it. But when you start to get granular at the campaign level, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me as much where I want to just understand, Hey, this part of the ecosystem is driving X amount of revenue for me. And it costs me Y amount to have this tool to capture X amount of revenue. I think where I agree with you is anything around like flows and automations, anything on that front. I totally agree. Cause you kind of set those up right to nurture and do their thing automatically. So that part, I agree. I think where I disagree is on the campaign front. Cause I do believe how I like to send out any campaigns is through segmentation. Sure, so 100% that, with you guys there. So that's where I would like to see the cost associated in platform. The difference is you're, you would just see it in platform and be able to see your cost and your revenue there in platform without having to go back and forth. So, I mean, it's just, it's just an ease of use is more or less why I would like that. So I'm not like bouncing. So let me ask you this then. What changes do you make using that? Well, I would I would definitely be able to see what segments are best and what segments. But those are aren't not a function of cost. You're going to know that by return by conversion value. Like well, everybody's going to cost the same. Yeah, they do. But if I see a segment that isn't performing well and hasn't been performing well, then I'm probably going to stop sending it to that segment. But cost you can get that without cost. He's just saying you can look at the click based attribution and say how much these people converted, how many yeah cur conversion rate, conversion value, how many people sent. I, like there's yeah. all these things that are way more meaningful than the actual cost of like oh it cost me a hundred dollars to send this campaign or something. That that's not in my opinion not a priority metric in this because it's not directly linked to actual return. Like you're paying for infrastructure, where in actual ads you're paying for impressions. Well, I'd say, I'd say it's, I'd still say it's pretty similar to me. I think it's just, if segments aren't working, then you can exclude those and segments that are working. How do we 
get more people added to that segment. I think it's more of an efficiency thing. No, I hundred percent agree with you. My pushback is cost doesn't like that doesn't come into my equation. The way I would think about cost was be, okay, at the end of the month, how much did Clavio generate for me? How much did SMS generate for me? And then is this still a tool that I can afford because the cost of revenue is positive or it's negative. But for me at the yeah. cost, like I, I would look at much more valuable metrics than cost on an SMS or email campaign. Well, I agree. I think, I think it's just getting to like a budget optimization, right? It's like, yeah. I think we're saying the same thing different ways. I just don't understand how the granularity of the cost on something that is architectural and not impression based. Well, I think, I think with Clavio, it doesn't matter as much. I think with like a postscript where you are spending money per text message sent, Mm -hmm. I think that's where, I think that's where it can matter a little bit more. Now it, it obviously just depends on how big your audience sizes are, but if you have like a VIP list that has 15,000 customers, and then Mm -hmm. outside of that, you have a regular list that has, you know, 30,000 customers, but your VIPs drive 80% of your revenue, then I'd more be looking at like what, I don't know, what more or less like creates a VIP customer to move them from this 30,000 group into this 15,000 group or whatever. Which I thousand percent agree with you, but how does cost help that decision well because if i'm sending if i'm sending thirty thousand text messages to this other group yep and it's it's only yielding 20 percent of the revenue yep but it's still 80 percent of my cost right right so it's like i can i can cut that 80 percent or whatever percent you know yep. and then only spend money on this 20 percent then i think it's actually a big like cost saver I just right. got eighty percent of my cost. But couldn't you derive that from performance data, not cost data? Well, yeah, I think I think they work the same, don't they? No, I think perform again. Performance data is something that I drive the boat. I I essentially think of like PostScript, Clavio, these things as architecture that I'm paying for, and then how do I leverage that architecture to make money? And then what are my best performance things? But I, I think I, what Saunders saying is just the like. You need to make the, the conversion value from the 30,000 people. Like, let's say that made up 60 grand. Yeah. That might look good until you realize how much you spent to make the 60 grand. And what, what, what Saunders saying is if you visualize it in the table, you could all, always go back into the month and look at total cost of postscript. But then you'd realize really fast that the amount you spent going towards your regular list, you could literally cut that out and your total return on postscript would be much, much better. Because VIPs like are making up more revenue. Yeah. Right. But why would cost be a function there? Like, wouldn't you just be like, dude, I sent a ton of SMSs and I know SMSs have a cost and I know that none of these people are converting. So why do I need to actually have it at the dollar? But cent you level? wouldn't know that none of these people are converting. I'm telling you that you wouldn't know the relativity of cost to the revenue made. So if the regular 30,000 person list made you 60 grand or whatever, right. that might look really good to you. It would, because okay. it's just sixty grand. Okay, but you have no idea if it cost you sixty thousand dollars to actually send the messages. But I do. I know what I paid last month for PostScript. No, as in aggregate, not per segment, not necessarily. I don't know. I'm I'm in the weeds now. I'm not. I I, can't, <laughs> I I think I understand what you guys are saying. I just don't agree with it. But different strokes for different folks. I, I think so. So I guess the the better question coming back to to Kenny B, Powerful Riot Society is is there any like because I, I just don't know how you disentangle the costs either like so what about your flows do you what would be flows are you tracking costs on your but you're paying like for the those campaigns flows, you're sending but you're still paying for, but this, you're still paying for the flows yeah, yeah. and th- th- that's a fixed cost more or less right no, I agree no, with I, that. Your campaign costs. It's variable because the flows are triggers by events. And so you don't know how many people you're going to come in and get a welcome flow. I know. Let me, let me wrap this up for a second and let's see if you agree with what I'm saying. I agree to look at flows. Let's say you have a welcome flow and an abandoned card flow. Every person you send that abandoned card flow as an SMS or MMS mm-hmm. will impact the cost. It's more expensive the more people that come in. Correct? Uh, you sent yes. more volume means Correct. more money. Spent. Me. Yep. Okay. 100% with you. So I think you need to review your flows and your campaigns by revenue in Triple Whale. Look at the click-based attribution, understand how well it's working from that perspective. Yep. Then go into PostScript 
yep. and try to find out how much money you spent on the various flows and campaigns. And where I think cost comes becomes a factor is that the abandoned cart flow mm -hmm. could be costing you more. Like the ROI on the abandoned cart flow might not be profitable because of how much you're spending. Mm -hmm. And one example of a way to be more efficient there is you could find out that in one of your messages, you're sending an MMS that counts as three SMSs. Yep. Right. And you could find out that by reducing the three SMSs to one, just a text-based campaign yep. actually makes your entire flow profitable. I don't know, just an example, but like that's that's how I would go about doing it. So is there I, I have a I have a real use case. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm over here. The peanut gallery is killing me today. <laughs> All right. Hit me. Hit me. Sorry. Right. So with my wife and I's boutique that we had like four or five years ago, online right. Shopify. Yep. We created we would have launches every single week. Yep. What we did for our VIP group is we would give them an hour early access where we would Love send it. them the password and they would get in. Yep. So to send to that entire VIP group, um, you know, it would cost us, I, I honestly don't remember now, let's just say $500, Yep. right? To send SMS to all of them. Yep. Well, what we started noticing is that we kind of had VIPs within our VIP. Yep. And so what- Just what segmentation. We, yeah, exactly. So then I segmented that out and I was able to cut 80% of our campaign cost by doing that and still generate more or less 90% of the same revenue. So yeah. that's where I'm saying, like, that's where I like, that's where I think the cost to revenue, like, that's where it makes sense. On the flow side, I agree with you. We're on the same page there. I'm just more saying on the campaign side. Again, I totally understand what you guys are saying. I just find the level of granularity unhelpful where like I would look at, those performance metrics. And then I would say, Hey, you know, we spent X amount of dollars this month on postscript. It generated Y amount of dollars. Like that's what really if you could put that extra three grand saved on postscript into your ads and drive another. No, I'm not saying you should, I'm not saying you shouldn't check the cost structure again, but for me, it's more of a return on investment than it is an actual like one-to-one -one campaign stuff. Because what happens if your campaign sucks? Like that, yeah, that, that's not on the cost. No, 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 it's a marketing issue. Like this is all marketing. And what you guys are talking about is operational efficiency where it's like, we're paying for this thing. This thing is returning X. We need it to return Y. You either need to make the marketing better or you, need, and to your point, like all the costs associated with it are going to be the same essentially. And so I would much rather look at uh, performance metrics than cost metrics. Like I'd rather make more money and then back into my cost than understand like, oh, I can trim here or there. I don't know. You, guys, like make, you guys make really valid points. I just That's just not how my brain works because I'm walking down the P&L where it's like, hey, this, this piece of architecture cost me X. What's my return on investment on that piece of architecture? Not how effective are my ad campaigns in there because they're not the, those have nothing to do with cost. But well, like I agree. Marketing I mean, is about marketing. I think if you look at my example, that's more or less what we did is I looked at performance metrics first and what exactly. was exactly that's, that's what I'm saying. So that's right. my point. Like that's how I would approach it and segment it. And then every month understand, hey, is this actually is the rental of this architecture net positive for the business or net negative or net neutral? And then I would modulate around that. I don't I don't see how I would at a campaign level like Cost will be the same, so I can then essentially take that out, and then I can understand what my performance metrics are. But anyways, we've spent a ton of time on this. <laughs> integrate your costs. Don't integrate your costs. At the end of the day, make sure you send fantastic SMSs, fantastic emails. And I think <laughs> if anything you take away from this, segmentation is a really interesting and important way that you can really – augment a lot of your marketing performance because the right message to the right person at the right time is invaluable. You see what you did, Kenny? You, you, you took us down the path, baby. Just, just stir um, it up, Kenny. Just stir it up. What else? We had a really good whale mail yesterday on retention. I'm going to pull that up. Let me actually... Yeah, wanna, oh, we'll start, you know, go ahead, Logan. Well, I uh, maybe it's relevant to the folks on here. We were talking earlier on the Pixel team about ways to visualize the data and how we can make this more impactful for people. Yep. yep. And one idea we had was creating a view where the only thing you see are new customer purchases, new customer conversion value, uh, with the idea that marketing dollars should be spent towards new customer acquisition. But interestingly enough, we were debating 
Like as you become a bigger brand, should you be thinking about dedicating certain campaigns and channels to, or tactics really, towards re-engaging past customers? And then how do we help people visualize that and understand like the total CAC for a customer against their total value to your brand? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, to me, that's one, absolutely the path. And then two, I think it gets into essentially how you have your funnel set up. I mean, like at what stage do you capture this and then what your what stages are your funnel, right? So you have the acquisition part where there's awareness, consideration, conversion. There's your acquisition. I got somebody to buy. And then what's the retention and how do I activate those retention? I think, I mean, those are the two pieces that make the, the pie, in my opinion. And so I think it's brilliant. And I, I do agree that the majority of your paid media should be around incremental revenue. And the majority of your retention should be around email, SMS, own channels, organic. Like I, I have, uh, depending on the price point, sometimes like if you have a massive price point product, like I've been snooping around this fancy, like uh, I'm going through like midlife crisis, so I want to blow a bunch of money. And there's like this, uh, it's called Ren Silva. They make like these beautiful custom, um, uh, like OG record player kind of things with like the built-in speaker stuff. It's beautiful, but it's like mm. 12 grand. Like it's a huge purchase. So if you have that, that might make sense for some retargeting there. But for the most part, I, I think that's absolutely a beautiful way. Of, I mean, that's essentially how I have the dashboard set up. I kind of stole like Euron Saunders' best ideas and I have essentially like an acquisition part of my dashboard and then the the returning part as well because I customer mix absolutely matters. And the, the other thing too that, and I'll, I'll stop rambling here, but in... Um, Retention is going to be, again, a function of your SKU set and then your sales cycle. So if it's a consumable, that's fantastic. You know, maybe I can get a subscription or something. But if it is um, like Ridge, where it's like you're going to buy one Ridge wallet, what did he do? He's brilliant. He expanded, right? Like you can buy a keychain now. You can buy a valet tray. You can do these things. And so once I get somebody to buy a wallet, what other things can I upsell them into? Uh, but no, I, I think that's the best way to look at it. I, I think you're spot on. Well, yeah. So, so to bring Sonder into this too, here's where I want to take your examples there and put it into like tactical things that the audience can take away. Um, at what point do you start dedicating marketing spend, targeting past customers? And that marketing spend can be Facebook or it could be direct mail, whatever it is. How do you determine when Clavio SMS have run, not run their course, but you could expand upon that revenue how do you know that you could maybe get more incremental value from past customers by targeting on Facebook? Have you guys run into that before where you're like, hey, I want to actually spend dollars targeting customers from 180, 180 days older and older that haven't engaged with, with email or SMS or something? You are. Go ahead, Sandra. I think to me that... Ugh. I don't know. Ah, it, still it makes, me, it makes me feel gross. No, it just makes me feel gross. I think if you're like having issues with Clavio or PostScript, it's probably because your your nurture nurture marketing is like probably just like so transactional and spammy. Like I think that's so. It's like cool. You'll send out a direct mail campaign on Postpilot and give them a twenty percent off coupon so you can track it. So yeah, obviously they're probably going to buy now at that point. But if you would have done that. Through Clavio with twenty percent, would they have you know done the same thing? But so let's just make me, an assumption that like a percentage. I don't know what how big, but let's just say a percentage of customers either don't interact with email or they unsubscribe. And it's not because they hate you. It's just that like ah, yeah, I don't really want to mess with it. That's good. I like that. What are you going to do with those folks though? Yeah, I mean, Actively. I mean, I think that's where I'm like so bullish on community marketing because it's like. Like find another path to interact, engage with them. That's not yeah. transactional. But it, it's not that. That's where it's like there's a, I don't know, a woo. I guess more more my woo woo approach. There has to be like an equal energy exchange, right? So it's like so many brands right now are just like in your face, in your face, but they never usually give their customers a way to like give back outside of like transactional ways, right? And so I think that's where really figuring out ways to like engage your community and allow them to like give back to the brand. I think that's like the biggest thing missing. So 
I would try to like figure out ways to do that first. Now, yeah, I think anyone that's unsubscribed, I think you probably, I would probably time that more around like your Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you know, maybe send like the end of October, early November, like do some direct mail campaigns to anyone who's unsubscribed. I'm more trying to get in front of people when they're in the mindset of buying is like really what I'm trying to do. So anytime you have more of a seasonal product, right? I'm trying to get in front of them then. So from a marketing perspective, that's probably what I would do um, with like an unsubscribe or you're not in front of your customers anymore type thing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the the way I would approach it maybe a little differently is even if somebody had like a massive LTV, so they spent $300 with my store, this is actually something I did with a, a previous client where we took like the best whales that haven't, to your point, purchased in like 180 days. I consider those people new customers. Like if you haven't messed with my brand in six months, like I consider you like to use SaaS terminology churn, where it's like, I'm going to interact with you, like not in a way that isn't going to acknowledge your previous purchases, but in a way that like, I, we need to start dating again. We need to get, you know, like this is, so I think the post pilot stuff gets really interesting. The other thing that you can really think about is, is it easier to, and again, this is going to be contextual to the business, the products you can sell, but is it easier to get more money out of the people that are loving your brand? Or is it easier to get more money out of people that are on the periphery of your brand? Or can you push people that are on the periphery into that, like, super user thing that's more how i would approach it versus um thinking of things in a silo it's almost like concentric circles how can i keep pushing them into that evangelist super user um and what i can do to do that and so i have no problem sending a 20 percent off coupon to somebody that's spent you know 2x the ltv of my store and here's a coupon post pilot we love you you're awesome we have a new product whatever whatever but i also think that Saunders really on to something where the more touch points you can build in, the more like it's to extend Saunders analogy, I almost think of it like relationships, like a bank account, right? Like, am I making deposits into the bank account or am I making withdrawals from the bank account? And a lot of times those withdrawals are really pricey. And so you have to modulate your brand equity with the asks from your customer. But if you're constantly generating value in ways to Saunders point where I can interact with the brand in a non-monetary way, but I get value from it as well. That just starts to stack on each other. And then you do get, uh, in my opinion, more better performance and more rabid fans when you actually build a sincere relationship. And that's the key thing. It has to be rooted in sincerity and actually value generation. It can't just be this uh, post and ghost, give me your money. But So can I ask you to um, make it a little a little tactical? Because I like, I like, there's a couple of points I want to draw out. Maybe we can use Kenny as an example because I think we've all talked to him and we yep. like his we like his product. Yep. Um, the concentric circles mm-hmm. is the tactical way to measure that success to define what the inner circle is, and then work towards building as many people numbers wise into the middle. Yeah. So I, I you know, mm-hmm. I would actually lean a little bit on our S. What is it? Smart CDP. SCDP. SCDP. Yep. Oh, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> in terms of understanding recency, frequency, monetary. So how soon did they purchase? How many times have they purchased? How much money have they purchased? That is going to be the parameters for me on the concentric circle. And the people on the innermost have purchased the most recent, have purchased the most frequent, or yeah, frequency, purchased the most times, purchased the biggest amounts, and purchased most recently. Those are the people that I want to get the most and elevate. And how can I push people into that? The other thing, too, you can look into is seeing, understanding, um, how people flow through products, right? So they bought this product, they bought that product, they bought this product, and then understand, okay, people bought product X, but we know from our historical data that a lot of times people buy Y and Z after they buy X. How can I um, not only build either education or something around that to put these products in a place of like, oh, hey, you just got your uh, Amazing Fish t-shirt. You know what? We have this really cool plaque that you can fill or you can put your you know fish tickets in or we have the matching shorts to your shirt or like how can you make their experience better by giving them more product and allowing them to interact with the brand so that would be my tactical like start to your point like kind of that that radiating strategy of like who are the people that are the best most awesome people what do they do what do they buy how often do they buy and then from that build the the kind of concentric circles around that to then keep laddering people up into that. 
Awesome. Sandra, you got anything to add? No, I like that. We finally I, uh, agree. We agree. I know. I the, right. the producer, you got to turn down the heat. People were, were losing, we're losing too, much, too many people. Too many. Um, but yeah, I mean, of, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Now I'm talking over you. I'm bad. No, no, it's all good. I, uh, well, speaking of that last point you made about the fish t shirt or whatever, this actually is another apparel brand that I bought. I was like, yep. now I'm speaking from a customer's perspective here perspective here with a marketer's brain, but I was looking for a shirt that I could wear. It's like probably okay for work, a little yep. casual, yep. but like honestly, I could wear in the heat down here because you know in Austin it's hot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I found this cool brand that I've kind of heard of on Instagram, but then like I found out about the shirt they had and I was like, this is great. Yeah. Now here's my point. And retention marketing, I feel like people don't lean into deep segmentation enough yes. with yes. their messages because I bought this shirt and I really like it. Like I didn't give a review yet, but I like it and return it. So whatever signals you want to use there, I get it like an SMS, like, I don't know, a week or two after purchase. And it was so funny because it was a blanket message and it said, meet the whatever shirt. I was like, meet the shirt. I bought the shirt, dude. Like yeah. you should be sending me a message that says, here are 10 ways you can wear this shirt or use yeah. it or learn how this cool surfer in California yeah. surfs in this shirt and wears it all. I don't know. And is, uh, is that just fit perfect. And then, Oh, by the way, we have these other shirts that fit just as perfect or whatever. A hundred percent with you. Yeah. Or we just launch new colors and the, like send me with something that's like t tailored to what I bought at least. And uh, I don't think that happens enough. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I also, and I don't know what the solve is for this in terms of exclusion, but I, I, I can't tell you how many times I spent a ton of money with the brand and then I get back on Instagram and they're serving the ads. And it's just like, mm. dude, I just literally bought a ton of stuff from you, but I, I don't know what the solve is there because I'm, I'm on the fence with exclusions and then blah, blah, blah. But no, I mean, I think Sandra touched on this earlier. Uh, retention or segmentation is way more important in retention marketing than it is acquisition marketing. Like, you know who the person is. And then again, being able to have the right message for the right person at the right time, not only does it help performance, but it deposits things in that bank account because you feel like the brand cares. You don't feel like it's a transaction. You go, oh, hey, Sandra, I saw you bought this shirt. That's awesome. I'm fish fans too. Are you going to the next concert? Or hey, have you seen the crazy uh, video from fish with the crazy whales and stuff like that? Like, how can you build in those brand touch points without actually withdrawing from the bank account? Um, and the only way you can really do that meaningfully is have a really good hold on your segmentation because a, a friend to everyone's a friend to no one. So if you just have these blank blasts everywhere, there might be some people that are going to convert, but there's also going to be those people that are going to be a little bit either turned off or feel it, it moves more into that transactional realm because you're not taking into – it'd be like – me and you meeting, right? And we have these really this really deep conversation. And then I see you at a conference the next week. I'm like, hey, Logan, I'm Raba. You're like, dude, I, we had like a two hour conversation and some beers and you're not even gonna acknowledge that. I feel like that's the same thing when you get hit with a piece of acquisition marketing that isn't in alignment with the reality of your purchasing. Yeah. And so this, maybe we'll start with Sandra first because he brought this up and then you reiterated on it, Raba. But um Get, talking about like brands giving back and like this reciprocating method using like riot society as an example mm -hmm. is is the would you say like the lowest hanging fruit is around content creation or is it around creating like a facebook group to where you can interact with people like i'm curious what you guys think are like good ideas that people could be actionable and go do tomorrow that would help them build something that reciprocates the love back to the consumer in a non-transactional way so I think, well, I'm not going to pull, I guess, specifically from Riot Society here. Sorry, Kenny. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think the space that's probably done this the best in recent history is like the NFT yeah. space. I think more specifically, you look uh, at like Bored Ape Yacht Club, right? It's like, they don't create content anymore. Or when they do, it's for big projects. All of their content is being created by their community. And then they're just sharing the content being created by their community. And they have it, it's an ecosystem now. It's like when you're in the club, now you're in the club. And it's like, they have people hosting meetups, you know, all over the country doing it themselves. And then, yeah, maybe um, Board Ape will like send whatever, you know, like, you know, 
pay for the drinks, you know, surprise them with paying with the drinks at the yep. meetup, or they might have a representative go and like, you know, like hand out some pins or like other like tangible collectibles while they're there, right? Kind of like build on it. So I, I to me, I think that's when you've really found community is when it's its own ecosystem and yep. it's thriving and it doesn't really need you. Now you can add to it and it just amplifies it, right? And so I think to me, that's like what true community is. So I don't know if that answers your question, Logan, but that to me, that feels like what, like in my eyes, when I say community marketing, that's like what I'm, what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I think that's beautiful. The one challenge there is a community is really hard. Um, it yeah. does take a lot of work to build at the beginning. Um, but and you to your perfected point, it. So what did you do? My, that was my first hire. It was Kevin, head of community. Um, but some other things, if community isn't necessarily on the docket, um, the way I think of it, Logan, is how, like it, even with Triple, when we were designing like the acquisition strategy here, it's like how many touch points can you have that can create value for people? And again, using Kenny. So Kenny just dropped like the Cinco de Mayo. So if you're in apparel, there's always going to be something, right? Whether it's a holiday or a look or um, the other thing, too, that I think you can really lean in on is telling the stories of your customers. Like this is Logan in his favorite fish t-shirt at the concert. Did anybody else go? Does anybody else like fish? And then again, it, the way I guess the too long didn't read is how can you build content and communication that feels like you're speaking to your consumer, not the group of your customers. And that's how we mm -hmm. write whale mail that like, how can you connect on a one-to-one -one level and get value from it? And so again, it, 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 for Kenny at Riot Society, he has so many cool designs. So there could be giveaways there could be user submissions for hey we, we're going to do every month a user uh user generated piece uh t-shirt that's only going to have a hundred so you have to get it here or how can you build exclusivity but without um really putting people off but then there's a certain aspect of like look at liquid death right like there's a certain value to owning who you want to be and really exuding those core values throughout every brand touch point so for me the too long didn't read is how can I either have a newsletter, some, some sort of cadence, ideally weekly, that I can touch on these people and generate value that has zero, zero performance metrics. The only performance metric is how many people showed up, how often or how awesome and engaged were they, and then how many people come back the next week. And just think of it like throwing parties. And how, what, why would you want to come to the party? Maybe it's just a YouTube live. Maybe it's an Instagram live going through the new collections that are coming. Like, there's all these creative ways, but the meta skill is how can I connect with somebody one on one with things they care about and they can leave either saying, hey, I'm smarter from this or, hey, I laughed or, hey, my day is better after doing that. It sounds kind of hippy dippy, but that's how I would start building out my brand touch points because D to C is it's like Reddit, man. It is the second you become insincere, you get flamed like it has to be rooted in value generation and sincerity. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> it, it's true though, right? Like you go on Reddit, you better have your fucking big boy pants on because like you start spitting nonsense on there, dude. You just get wrecked. And so, oh, I, <laughs> I definitely know. <laughs> so I from, do, I used to do a lot of Reddit marketing. Oh, we'd, yeah, get, yeah. we'd get companies on the front page, oh, but it would be like get going into like yeah, you'd have to like infiltrate new subreddits oh, based yeah. on the content. So yeah. We'd always like go on there and like. Oh man, sometimes we would just get destroyed. Yeah. So it can be how dare you come into my subreddit? Yeah. Oh, it, it can be a fiefdom kind of it, it, it is not a forgiving environment. But, but when you but, when you nailed it, two million visitors to a website like that, you know. Oh, if you can wow. do it in a native way, it can be yeah, it's it's two two what is it? Two double sided sword, right? Like yeah. that's one way or can cut the other. But anyways, kind of just to wrap up, Logan, what you're talking about and some actual takeaways. Um, I think a newsletter is an amazing way to connect with people. Some people it's really hard to write. So that might be something where you can do some sort of wrap up or, I mean, exactly what you're doing with uh, Sunday Dink Club, right? Like you have this passion, you're in this space, you understand this space, you're really good at synthesizing information. And here's, you want to be better at pickleball. You want to keep up with all the latest news of pickleball, blah, blah. You're not selling anything. And that's the kind of attitude you need to have when you're building out this content ecosystem or this community it can't be the main goal can't be to generate acquisition or improve retention like those need to be on the roadmap and those need to be the things that are pushing forward but the main goal needs to be connection value generation 
those are the two things that I think you really need to concentrate on when you're building out either a content strategy or your community, because if not, it's, it's just going to end in flames. Or I, I have yet to see an insincere community flourish, put it that way. Agreed. Nice. Don't go giving a hot takes on uh, Dune Volume 2 on Reddit. Get roasted. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, when is that? Did you, is it, did you, got, you got a drop date for us, Sandy? Nothing? That's in November. November. I really think that could be the new Star Wars. I was I was really excited for it. It's cool. Well, but it's they're only. I think this is the last movie. Oh really? So I don't know. Really? About stuff. I thought it was going to be like a big series. No. Well, I mean, they could. They might be able to spin it. I don't know what the original author did. I've been waiting to read the book, but hmm, I was I like, the book. I can't it remember was so the book. good. That that might have been like my favorite sci-fi movie ever made. Have you guys seen the new Nike movie? Like, is that as good as everybody says it is? Air? I haven't. Yeah. And ironically, you know, that's kind of my space. I have not seen it, but uh, it's on the it's on the docket. I've been going through, uh, like, my toxic trade is World War II documentaries. I've just been ravaging <laughs> them. Isn't that weird? Okay. I don't know what it is. I love like Band of Brothers, not not a documentary. but Dude, Band of Brothers, I made it through, but it was a little slow. I thought what it was going to be. What do you mean? I got to, where am I at? They're in... Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. What episode are you on? I think like, I'm like midway through the series. Is the Pacific better or no? Banner Brothers is way better. Banner Brothers. I like it. Don't get me wrong. I just uh, I think it could have been a function too of you know when somebody just gasses something up beyond belief. Like I have two of my buddies. They're like, dude, this is the best series you'll ever watch. And I'm like, dude, like The Wire, Breaking Bad. There's there's some other series that I think are in a different level, but it's really good. It's really. I think good. it's the best mini series ever made. What's your best mini series, Logan? I don't even know how you define one. What's give me another example? Just like, like one season, six to eight. Yeah, one season, six to eight episodes usually. Almost like an elongated movie. Like Chernobyl was one on HBO. Chernobyl was that was amazing. That, that was yeah. amazing. sensational. Chernobyl was strong. HBO just pumps out the best ones. But. Yeah, there Chernobyl was a couple was of shows that like the one. The one show that I really liked was Vinyl that got canceled. Um, I don't know if you guys watched that. It was on HBO. That was great. You guys um, succession people? Yeah. I haven't yeah. watched the last two episodes though. Yeah. Yeah. Succession. It's that's also uh, a pretty good one. Billions was good for a little while, but then it kind of it got it's the same thing with handmaid's handmade tale. Yeah. It got gets a uh, yeah, same but, but Axel Rod's coming back this season. Oh, oh really? Jimmy crickets. Oh, let's go. Oh, I don't know. I'm excited. They probably saw, they probably saw the, 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 the ratings. ratings. <laughs> it's it. <laughs> That's it. Can't stay it. in Switzerland forever, you know. I love he's, it. He's coming back with a vengeance, as he is. Uh, okay, no other questions. All right, Bobby, thank you for joining us. Um, this was amazing, guys. Really, really helpful. And it and for everybody listening, we all love each other. So if I came across douchey or combative, that was not the um, <laughs> intent. Uh, I just love talking to these guys and. They push we, back we, on me. We like the passion, yeah. Robba. Yeah, it's a passion project. It's a passion we all, project. We all appreciate each other's passion. You know? That's it. That's Great. it. Marketing. Everyone has different opinions. That's why it's marketing. Fair That's play. Right. Fair play. Um, what else we got? So if you aren't on Whale Mail, it's amazing. You subscribe Tuesday, Thursday. Incredible newsletter. TripWell.com slash Whale Mail. Subscribe there. What else we got? Is anybody here going to geek out? We only have like three people, so maybe we'll do it next week. Um, we'll give out some give, some geek out tickets next week for oh, the nice. event on the nineteenth, twentieth. So that's going to be awesome. It's in LA. It's going to be the first one of the year, so it's going to be massive. It's going to be awesome. What else we got? You're not your Roas drops every Wednesday, so we have a new one dropping today. Ad spend just dropped on Monday. What else we got? Any cool product updates you want to give? Any just high level, Logan? Uh, benchmarks activity feed both Ooh, hopefully in the next feed. two weeks yep activity yes. feed let's go uh sandy what else you got um i mean there's only a couple people here but if you'd yep. like to, to book a time with me reach out beautiful get something set up get nerdy with get nerdy with sander um i am off to go be on a panel at uh recur awesome with oh, uh, cool. paddle yeah with patrick campbell that guy's my oh, news sweet Oh, he's the best in the business, honestly. He's just the the SAS brain on that guy is just undeniable. So I'm super stoked for that. We'll send you guys some pictures. Make sure to follow us on the Twitters. 
Uh, yeah, that's all we got. We'll we'll end this one a minute early. Uh, any parting words, Logan? Sign up for the no, Dink Club. How do you how do you get on the Dink Club? You got to plug uh, this more, baby. You got to pump the baby. Come on. Hit me up on Sunday Dinking Club on Instagram or the Let's Dinking go. Club on Twitter. Let's I might go. hit my first thousand view video today. I am oh. put that comment in there baby put that comma no get the get the k on there the single uh, comma club What's let's up? go let's go uh sandy what you got for me uh logan have you heard of pickle fuel yeah uh-huh i uh i met with a co-packer yesterday to do some some flavoring and they they're one of their customers so they do all their nice is it literally cool. pickleball or pickling like cucumber no like pickle fuel but for like pickleball athletes like a pre-workout oh, for pickleball yeah. players. Oh, interesting. Look at that. Worlds colliding. I love yeah. that. Uh, all right, folks, make sure to follow Sonder Logan, myself on the Twitters. Uh, yeah, we'll see you next week, next Wednesday. We'll, we'll make sure to get the comms out earlier um, this week so we'll have a, a, a bigger party for you. But as always, uh, thank you so much for attending the Well webinar. We'll see you next week. Logan, always a pleasure. Sonder, you're the man. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Yeah.